It is really good to have everyone tonight. Welcome. We are certainly glad to have you here on this good Monday evening to hear uh, another portion of the gospel proclaimed by Brother Reagan McClenney. We have visitors with us, and uh, we're especially thankful for that. Um, a lot of old friends are here, so we're, we're so thankful that you came our way, and good to see you. Hope we get to visit a little bit, uh, and thank you so much for your support of this effort. I, I know you will benefit greatly from having been here, and I had uh, time spent in worship and study of God's Word. Our first song is going to be number 196, if you're following in the book, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. Uh, I thought it might be appropriate, since we're studying about heaven, to sing about heaven tonight, so some of the sentiments in the songs will no doubt fall right in line with what Reagan has to say. After this song, Brother Roberto Spencer will direct our minds in our prayer. Do so do do me so re read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truth in God's word he has given. How beautiful heaven must be. In heaven no drooping nor pining, no wishing for elsewhere to be. God's light is forever there shining. How beautiful heaven must be. The angels so sweetly are singing up there by the beautiful sea. The song of redemption is ringing. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free, fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. Brother Spencer. Let's pray. pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are very happy this day for the many blessings that you give us every day, especially today that we have a beautiful day and we have the opportunity to be here to hear all the good lessons that our brother has prepared for us. Bless him that he can remember everything that he studied and bless each one of us that we are able to listen, that we can retain the teaching of your word in our hearts. Our Father, we want to pray for our visitors, if we have some here, that they can understand the truth and they can obey the gospel in the near future. Also, our Heavenly Father, we ask for those members of the church that are a little sick, uh, they, they were not able to come today, bless them and that they can recover their health. And also we are praying for all those members of the church that have lost their, some of the relatives that die, especially for this sickness that is in the world, the COVID-19. Bless the families that have suffered the loss of the relative, like in Las Cruces, New Mexico, Brother Lozano, he died, and his son, and bless the families there, and in Juarez also, and in Peru, we hear that also they, some members have died. Pray for the, we pray that you bless and give comfort all the families there. Our family, brother, we continue asking you, protect us with your, uh, all power that you have 
that we can keep in good health. Bless the church here and the elders of the church that they can continue doing the good work and take care of the things that they had to do in this congregation. So our Heavenly Father, there are many other things that we can ask you, but uh, you know better than us. So, so we want to give thanks for everything that you do us, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. High above the seraphim sounds an everlasting hymn. Voices echo through the hall and shake the temple wall. Living creatures bless the king, four and twenty elders sing. Worthy he who overcame the word of God his name. Praise the seed of Abraham, all dominion to the Lamb. Sing of him in glory slain, Lord God Almighty reigns. Shout the god breathe prophecy, he who was, will ever be. Kings of earth have passed away. The Son is Lord this day. Night to night I come to him. Kneel before his diadem. While a thousand thousand sing, I fall before the king. Soon will he be changing me, clothed in immortality, swallowed up in victory and evermore to be. The song before the lesson will be number 194. If you care to, please stand while we sing this song. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the tolls of life repay when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory be seated please Now, something that I've heard a great deal in my life, and it's certainly true, we cannot understand the full reality of heaven. 
But I'm afraid sometimes that that truth keeps us from really studying the images that we are given of heaven in our Bible. And these images are here because God uses things that we can understand to show us what heaven will be like. Not in literal reality, but in positive associations with things that we do understand while here on this earth. This week we're calling those glimpses of glory, that we get a small piece, a small taste of what heaven will be like. And we need motivation in our lives as Christians. Far too often it is not a matter of knowing what the right thing to do is, it's having the motivation to do that right thing. And these glimpses of glory where we see God and the spiritual realm and heaven laid out before us, These provide powerful motivations to us to do the right thing, to do what God would have us to do, and to maintain our covenant relationship with Him. These glimpses, however partial, should motivate us to live our lives as Christians. If you have your Bible with you, would you open it up and turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. We've spent a great time, great deal of time in Revelation 21 and 22. That's where we'll be again this evening. Revelation 21, we'll begin reading in verse 2 here in just a second. Uh, Let me take just a second to welcome all who are here. Uh, Many members are here, but we also have a number of visitors, uh, friends and family and people I grew up with. Uh, I'm so grateful for your presence, uh, that you're interested in spiritual things, and that you've taken the time to be here tonight. You could have chosen to be somewhere else. There's lots of other places you could have been But you chose to be here, and so I pray that our time together, first and foremost, glorifies God, but it'll be helpful to you as we're striving to be what He's called us to be on this earth. So I want to begin tonight uh, with just a little mental exercise. We say, okay, so God gives us these glimpses, these images, why doesn't He give us a fuller picture? If this isn't exactly what heaven is going to be like, why doesn't He just come out and tell us what heaven really, fully, truly is. Well, think about it in these terms. Um, With modern medicine, we know a great deal about what a baby in the womb experiences. Uh, We know, for instance, that a baby in the womb can, can see light and dark. It can distinguish voices. It hears sound. Obviously, there's movement that goes on in the womb. All of those sorts of things are true. But I want you to imagine for a moment that we could communicate somehow with a baby in the womb. And your job, should you choose to accept it, is to describe this world in which we live to a baby in the womb. Now, that womb is the baby's world. That's all that baby has ever known to that point. But your job is to communicate what this world is like using only the experiences that the baby has had while in the room. How would you describe this world? That's pretty tough, isn't it? And and what we're left with are some really generic terms like, well, this world is bright because a baby can distinguish light and darkness. This world is loud because it can hear and distinguish voices. This, This world is colorful. And this world is roomy. There's lots of places to stretch out, right? Now, is that an accurate description of this world and what this world is? Well, all of those things are true about this world in which we live, right? That's an accurate description. But is it an adequate description of this world? So too with God. He is limited not by him, he is limited by us. And so God describes heaven in terms we can understand, but fail to adequately describe everything that heaven will be, not because God chooses the wrong words, but because we cannot understand how it really is with our limited experience here in this physical world. And when we're in heaven, we'll see so much more. We will know so much more, and all will become clear to us. Uh, I read this quote just last week. One man said, when it comes to truly seeing heaven, we're all Helen Keller. We are limited by 
what little we can see here on this earth to see and understand and perceive how great heaven will be. But what we can see and what we can perceive and understand to a certain degree are those things that we've already talked about. A city of complete safety and eternal permanency and incredible size where all who desire to come into that city can with wonderful people that I want to be with. We can understand those images that God gives us. We can understand to a certain degree a paradise where there's no death or pain or sorrow or sin, where we have life and have it abundantly and where we can dwell with God in perfect fellowship for all eternity. And all of that sounds wonderful and it should, but it is just a glimpse of what heaven will really be like. Well, our third image that we find here in the book of Revelation is for many of us the most relatable, and that is the Bride of Christ. And if you're there in Revelation 21, begin reading with me in verse 2, if you would. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her, her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Drop down to verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And he goes on to describe that glory in all of these Terms. Now, we've read all of that already in our study up to this point. I, I want you to consider something there, there in verse 9. In this vision, John is very specific about which angel appears to him. He says, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues. Now, the Bible leaves out a lot of details, and so when details are included like that, I would suggest that every detail matters. But this seems like such an odd, misplaced detail. We're told which specific angel, and he says it's one of those angels who brought those seven bowls that had the seven plagues. What's up with that? Why does he identify specifically which angel it is? And you would think that it would be a better angel than one of the plague angels that's going to tell us about heaven. Tell us about the bride of Christ. Well, this detail is included, I believe, to remind us of something that came earlier in the book of Revelation. We think about the bride and she's described in Revelation 21. But if we go back to Revelation chapter 17, that same angel is found. But this angel is not describing a bride. Instead, the angel is describing a harlot, a prostitute, as we find in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which is full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery. Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And I saw her and I marveled and was amazed. Now, 
We don't have time this evening to go all through the book of Revelation and explain all that imagery. But here's what I want you to see. The bride of Christ in her holiness and in her beauty is not just a powerful image in and of itself. It also in the book of Revelation provides a powerful contrast with this harlot. The harlot and the bride. A tale of two women. A tale of two cities, as we've talked about the New Jerusalem as opposed to this Babylon the Great. And to really appreciate and understand this imagery and understand the contrast that's being made in this book, I think we really have to answer and, first of all, ask the question, why did God create marriage to begin with? I mean, have you ever given that any long and serious thought? Certainly we see certain benefits with marriage, we see certain beauty with marriage, but, but what was the purpose for which God created marriage? Well, there are a number of correct answers to that, but let's go back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 2. If you'd like to mark your spot there at the end of the book of Revelation, we've covered the end of the Bible, let's go back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Earlier here in this chapter, we'll read verse 23. Earlier, the Godhead has said it's not good for man to be alone. That's a good first reason for marriage, right? Because man needed help. It was not good for him to be alone. And so God's going to make a helper comparable to him. But that's not all. In verse 23, and Adam said this. I like the English Standard Version. This at last. I've seen all the animals, I've given them names, but this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now there are lots of good reasons why God created marriage. But the marriage relationship was intended by God to be closer than any other relationship that we have on earth. These two are to leave their respective families and to become one flesh in a covenant relationship till death do them part. And so one reason why God created marriage that we don't talk about a whole lot is to show us what this kind of love and unity and intimacy is supposed to look like. To show us what covenant love is supposed to be. And God created this relationship of a husband and a wife to teach us about our relationship with Him and what it could be like in perfection. In this relationship, we are to put to death the me for we. The man is to cleave to his wife, to become one flesh with her, and so too the woman with her husband. And all of this is a type, a shadow of our relationship with Christ. We turn to the New Testament in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. If you'll turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 5. Start in verse 22 with me, if you would, please. Ephesians 5 and verse 22. All of this is groundwork, so then we can talk about the images of heaven. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, just also as Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands... Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Well, that sounds like what we read in Genesis 2, doesn't it? Well, then he quotes from Genesis 2 in verse 31. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one 
flesh. This is a great mystery, he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each of you, one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So what Paul says here is that we have these two things that are supposed to be an illustration for one another. Christ and the church is supposed to be an illustration for how husbands and wives are supposed to treat one another. But it works the other way too. That this relationship between a husband and a wife is supposed to teach us about the unity and the intimacy between Christ and His church. Here is the illustration, he says. I've been teaching you about the church and its relationship with Christ since the beginning of the world. Since Adam and the Eve, I've been showing you what the relationship between Christ and his people is supposed to be like. As the book of Revelation says, between Christ, the Lamb, and his bride, the church. And so we need to learn well the lessons that God is teaching through this vivid imagery. These two things are alike. And what is it that we're supposed to learn? You know, scoffers of the Bible have long said, you know, the, you know the problem with the Bible is, all you Christians, you've just gone and you've created a God in your own image. And so, so you've made God like man. But the easy answer and response to that is, it only stands to reason that an all-powerful God would create a world that would teach us about Him. That this physical world that He created and put us in would be filled with examples and illustrations and shadows and types of His nature and His desires for us. And what God desires with us is a loving covenant relationship. And it's not like this is a new comparison between God and his people. It's not like the Apostle Paul woke up one day and said, here's a new illustration. God and his people are like a husband and a wife. That image of a husband and wife is common in the Old Testament between God and his people. Lots and lots of examples I could give, but let me just give you two. The book of Hosea vividly portrays this very concept of God and his people as a husband and a wife in much more negative terms than what we see in Ephesians chapter 5. In that example, in Hosea and also in Ezekiel, it's the example of a bride who becomes a harlot, a bride who goes into prostitution, selling herself for money. And Ezekiel, that prophet, describes God's relationship with his people in the same way, but in much more graphic language. God saves this woman, Ezekiel the prophet says, who is supposed to be the people of God, the Israelites, to make her his wife, and she runs after other lovers. And she won't even take payment for her infidelity. She has totally defiled herself. And drunk of fornication just as the harlot in Revelation chapter 17. But then, we get to the New Testament. And especially the end of the book of Revelation. And the bride is pure again. It is made up of those and only those who love God. With all of their heart and soul and mind and strength. Who desire and choose to be with God. And Christ, the Lamb, is portrayed as the bridegroom. Again, the contrast of a bride and a harlot. So, as we've done with the other illustrations, what does the image of this bride imply about what heaven is and what heaven's going to be like? Well, first, the bride implies perfect purity and holiness. It is a bride who is adorned for her husband. And we imagine brides dressed in white. That is a common theme in the book of Revelation, this purity and holiness. And if we turn back to Revelation 21, notice a few verses with me. In verse 8, it gives the other side of this. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars 
shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. None of these people who have defiled themselves in this way and have not come to Christ for cleansing, none of them will be there. It is only filled with those who have been made holy in the blood of the Lamb. We drop down to verses 26 and 27. And they shall bring glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall be by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Earlier in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 7, 13, and 14, John talks about the pure white robes of the saints. Just like a bride's dress, even in our culture today, this pure white symbolizing holiness. Have you ever thought about, obviously it's heaven and it's a good place and that's why, but, but why is there no death or sorrow or crying or pain in heaven? And there can't be those things in heaven. Why? Because there is no sin in heaven. All of those things, death, sorrow, crying, pain, all of those things are caused either directly or indirectly by sin. My sin, the sin of somebody else, that we live in a sinful world, all of those things. But in heaven, sin has passed away along with the world. And how amazing will it be to be part of a people who live without any sin and the destruction that sin causes in our lives. And when it comes to illustrations, you know, as a preacher, you always want to have illustrations that hit lots of people. Well, there are unmarried people who, you know, don't know what it's like to be married, to have a bride or a groom. There are other people who've gone through very difficult marriages, and perhaps this doesn't hit them the same way it does others. But all of us know the destructive nature of sin. All of us have seen sorrow and pain and death. We've seen that destruction in our own lives from our own sin and how our sin has caused such destruction, even with those that we love the most. And the thought of a place that is only filled with purity and holiness, where I don't have to fight against sin any longer, where sin and its consequences are no more, that's something that we can all see and anticipate with hope. All of us who are striving to go to that place. The bride implies purity and holiness, but it also implies priceless value and breathtaking beauty. Um, we'll pick up where we left off in Revelation 21, beginning in verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the great city, holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was as a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates, and the names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. He who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are all equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. And he talks about jasper and sapphire and, and emerald and topaz and all of these beautiful colors, a, a rainbow of colors and light. And the twelve gates, verse 21, were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. You know, uh, I taught the book of Revelation about a year ago, and I went on uh, Amazon, and I was going to buy a, 
an example for each one of these stones. And wouldn't you know it, there was an offering on Amazon for like $150 that had each one of these stones. And it had a picture of it. It looked like it was about this big with each stone. I thought that would be an awesome illustration. So I paid the $150. It came in the mail. And you know how big it was? Why? Because these are precious and valuable stones that we're talking about here. You, you go through a jewelry store and you find their very best, most expensive, most beautiful stones and you enlarge them thousands and thousands of times where you can build the foundations of a city that's 1,500 miles long and wide and high. And all of that is overlaid with perfect pure gold that's like transparent glass. You talk about value, you talk about beauty. Uh, we think about some of the illustrations that Jesus used in regard to stones and that sort of thing. We know that the gospel is described in, in those terms in Matthew 13 as a pearl of great price. And when he found this pearl, that merchant man, he went and he sold all that he had that he might buy this one pearl of great price. Well, pearls can be expensive, especially large pearls. The largest pearl ever found was 75 pounds. This is a picture of that pearl right there. That's not exactly the round, perfect pearl that we imagined. Uh, this is actually about 50 pounds heavier than the previous world record holder. And in 2003, the previous pearl, this one has never been sold, but the previous pearl was sold in 2003. That was the year I graduated, so 18 years ago. It was sold for $93 million. And this one is 50 pounds heavier. How expensive would this single pearl be? And yet in heaven, there are 12 perfect pearls, all the size of gates, with angels next to them. Now again, as we've talked about, we don't need to think about that as, as literally there are 12 pearls and those sorts of things. There is an image that's being communicated to us of the value of this place and of the beauty of this place. And if we think about our contrast, I know it's uncomfortable to think about a harlot in comparison to a bride, but if we think about that contrast, a price is put on a harlot in a very literal sense, how much, not how much is she worth, but how much does she cost? That's really a form of slavery. You stop and think about it for any length of time. I'm paying to use and abuse another human being for my own selfish desires and interests. And let me say, just as an aside, the digital use of another human being in pornography is no better than going out and being involved in the sin of prostitution. And we see that in our world today with these women selling their bodies on websites to make money or others profiting upon them and what they're doing and there are plenty in our world who are willing to pay a very literal price for a harlot. But a good wife, a good wife whom you love, how can you put a price on that? You know, that comparison between jewels of great value and price and a good wife is exactly the comparison that we see in Proverbs 31. Uh, just a few verses there from the end of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs was written to a young man by his father. And the culmination of these sayings of wise advice come in chapter 31. Beginning in verse 10. Who can find a virtuous or excellent wife? For her worth is far above rubies or whatever other precious stone you want to put in that place. The heart of her husband safely trusts in her. She will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Drop down to verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. And that's positioned in these verses from 10 to 31 to be the peak of the chiastic structure here. Meaning 
A good woman like this is the reason why he's sitting in the gates. The reason why this man is what he is is because of the kind of woman that he married. And we see the way she is described by others in verse 26 and following. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And wisdom is described as a woman throughout this book of Proverbs. And on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. And here's what they say. I mean, any mother would love her her children and, and her husband to say this. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. It's not just her husband who's known in the gates among the elders of the land. She is known because of who she is as a virtuous and excellent wife. He says here that her worth is far above rubies. And the climax of the book of Proverbs and all this advice to a young man is you have to find a woman like this. Don't go after an idolatrous woman. Don't go after a contentious woman. Don't go after an immoral woman who are all described in the book of Proverbs. Find a wise woman like this. And all of these precious stones are not just about the value, they're also about the beauty. It's a kaleidoscope of colors reflecting the brilliance of God. You know, God is always described as having a rainbow over him and this bright light that proceeds from him. Now, can you imagine all of these clear stones and gold and the way they must shine from the glory of the Lord? There's no sun or moon because it's not needed. God is the light. And we imagine this light and colors something like this, a beauty that we have never beheld. And this is not a lusty, trashy hotness. It's not a modesty masquerading as beauty, but a pure, breathtaking beauty. And there's a beauty to a bride that honestly is unlike anything else, right? Over the course of my life, I've watched several brides walk down the aisle toward me. That doesn't sound quite right, does it? Here's the most recent bride. This is Rance and Haley. They'd die if they knew I was putting their picture up here, but they're not here. So here they are. And uh, what's interesting to me through this whole process uh, is really, maybe because I'm a man, I identify with the groom, right? Um, And those grooms, they're all alike in this way. They're all nervous as a cat. The whole day, you know, and we walk up there together and I feel like I'm having to take them by the arm and say, okay, you stand here. We've already practiced this and they're, they're jittery, you know, like, what am I going to do? I just have to repeat after the preacher, but you know, it's still nerve wracking. And then the bride appears and everybody stands, but he can see right down that aisle and all of a sudden he grows still because he sees the one whom he loves. And he's reminded why he's doing what he's doing, as uncomfortable as it is for him in the moment. That's my favorite part of the service. But I'll be honest, the the beauty of your own bride or groom is unlike anything else. If you're wondering why I switched the order of my lessons, it's because Stephanie and the girls decided to come with me. And I couldn't put this picture up if Stephanie were here. And seeing her walk down the aisle, walk down toward me, that's a special moment. A special moment of breathtaking beauty. But I've got to be honest. Unfortunately, I've seen all of those things present in a wedding. The groom who grows still, the bride and her beauty. And she walks down and they say, I do only for the marriage to fall apart just a few years later. Is this really all the beauty that heaven is about? Is this even mainly the beauty that heaven is about? May I suggest tonight, what is even more beautiful is when two people are totally committed to God 
And they can be called, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, fellow heirs of the grace of life. That they are totally committed to God and totally committed to one another too. And I'm glad that I reached a point in my maturity where the main thing I was looking for in a spouse was godliness. Now, preferably, I wanted that in a beautiful package, but godliness is what I was looking for. And when I met Stephanie, she was the most spiritually minded girl my age that I had ever been around. And it was striking to me, even in my immaturity. Even in all the ways I fell short, I said, there's something about her because of her godliness. What I knew as I got to know her is that Stephanie was going to heaven. And it was great if I helped her get there, but she was going whether I was going or not. And she's even more beautiful to me now in every way because of her spirituality. Our marriage isn't perfect, far from it. But it is a beautiful imperfect but beautiful shadow of what heaven will be like. Even a spouse, a beautiful spouse like mine, can't compare to the beauty of heaven, but they can give us a glimpse of heaven. And sometimes, sometimes a spouse can give us a glimpse of hell, too. To the unmarried, especially our, our young people, I appreciate your attention and Y'all sitting to the front, others who are here tonight. What kind of spouse are you looking for? You giving that any thought? Does he or she reflect? Reflect what heaven will be like. Are you looking for someone who will help you get to heaven? Are you looking for someone who is committed to you, but more importantly is committed to the Lord above you, who loves Jesus more than they love you. You know, I heard a lot growing up, and rightfully so, Reagan, you need to marry a Christian. But let me tell you, that's not about a box to check. That's not about, check, she's a Christian, yeah, you know, she's got some other problems, but boy, she's a Christian, she's been dunked in the water. It's about finding someone who has a good and honest heart who loves the Lord and wants to do what's right and is willing to listen to what the Word of God says about what that is. Is that what you're looking for? Even more importantly, is that what you find beautiful? Because if that's what's in our heart, that's what we will see as true beauty. That is the beauty of a covenant between you and him or her and God. And marriage is love for someone with whom we have an intimate and permanent relationship, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And so we think about what what this relationship is. It implies covenant unity and intimacy. If we go back to Revelation chapter 21, we see some some interesting things described in, in terms of these gates and in terms of the foundations. In verse 12, he says... The twelve gates had names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And in verse 14, the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, those were the people with whom God had a covenant, fellowship with under the old law. And the twelve apostles are representative of that new covenant, that that new relationship between Christ and His church as they they began that church on the day of Pentecost through Jesus Christ and the borders of that kingdom spread through them. And marriage helps us to understand this covenant relationship. This is how God loves others. He loves in a covenant sense. And over and over in the Old Testament, the text says in regard to God's covenant love, His steadfast love endures forever. Just go read Psalm 136 where it says it over and over and over. After each and every line, the people were reminded, His steadfast love endures forever. Maybe your translation says, His mercy endures forever. His loving kindness endures forever. Or more simply, His love has no end. 
And this is an acknowledgement that God always keeps His promises in mercy and grace and love and faithfulness and kindness. He remembers the promises that He has made. And it's a word that's expressed in a husband's devotion to his wife or a wife's devotion to her husband. He is this close to us. There is a relationship, a covenant here. But it's not just covenant unity and intimacy. Our final point tonight, the image of a bride implies covenant permanency as well. In marriage, you make vows to love from that point forward until when? What do we say? Till death do us part. That's right. And God demands for you to remember and keep those vows. And so too, God, by His grace, does not forget His people, but brings them to be with Him and reign with Him forever and ever. In Revelation 22 and verse 5, this is the way He describes it. There shall be no night there, they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. That's what this relationship is like. And with our physical relationship of a marriage, we know this covenant with God in heaven is not ended by death like marriage is because there is no death there. And we know, of course, that God gives one exception in this life. And that's unfaithfulness of a spouse where we might put away and then remarry. And so too when it comes to our relationship with God. It is the unfaithfulness where we strive after other lovers. Like is described in Hosea and Ezekiel. As even is described in Revelation 17 where money or fame or power or sensuality or any of these other things become more important to us than God. But if we are committed to Him, as He is to us, nothing can sever that relationship for all eternity. And the more we value marriage, the more we can imagine heaven, whether by contrast or by comparison. I know for some here this evening, this is probably a difficult lesson. Maybe you don't have a great marriage from which to see this image of what heaven is like. And maybe you say to yourself, if heaven's like my marriage, I'm not sure that's where I want to go. Well, may I suggest that contrast can be the same thing. Seeing bad or broken or ungodly marriages causes us to think, whether it's the marriage of someone else, whether it's the marriage of our parents, whether it's the own, our own marriage that we're in. We've all probably looked at marriages like that or thought of marriages like that and said, what if, what if both of those people would turn to God and then turn to one another in love? What a beautiful thing it could be. Now imagine a million times better where God is that faithful spouse to us He'll never hurt us or betray us. He's always there for us and always, always does what is best for us. And has proven that love in sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. Let me say this as we bring our lesson to a close. The ultimate marriage. There's some in here who have amazing marriages you know, there are newlyweds like Tookie and Jerry, you know, great marriages. But the ultimate marriage, the very best marriage that you can think of here on this earth is just a dim foreshadowing of the unity and intimacy, one flesh on this earth, and the permanency till death do us part on this earth that we will have with God in heaven. With God, it is not just one flesh. It is one in every way. With God, it is not till death do us part. We will never be parted for all eternity. Let me just share something with you that's always bothered me about heaven. Um, it bothers me that marriage ends. That my marriage to Stephanie, as special it is, as it is, it ends in death. Uh, I have a a great aunt and great uncle, uh, he's passed away now and 
And they're one of these couples that claims they've never had an argument in their whole life. With most couples like that, I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, you've had passionate discussions where you're both speaking loudly at one another, but you've never had an argument. With them, I can like 95% believe it. And what an example they were, not just to Stephanie and I, but to so many before my Uncle Johnny passed away. And I look at them and I look at two faithful Christians and I look at how much she yearns to go and be with him in paradise where she believes strongly as I do that he is. And I think that relationship, as powerful as it is, that's, that's ending and they won't have that same relationship. And That's weird, isn't it? Am I the only one who feels that way? I mean, Jesus says explicitly in, in Matthew 22... He says that in heaven we neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels. So why does marriage end? Well, I can think of two reasons. The first is, is really sad. Not all spouses will be together in heaven. And that breaks my heart. And young people, you need to think about that when you choose a spouse. But even if you're both there, you're not married anymore. You don't have the same relationship and that brings me to the second thing. The fact that marriage ends in death emphasizes that marriage, as important as it is as a relationship, is just a type, just a glimpse of something far greater. Marriage ends in death, but there is no death there. What a city. What a paradise. What a bride heaven will be. But unbelievers won't experience it. It is a place and a relationship that can be yours. But you have to want to go there. You have to have that desire. I want to go to heaven. I want to be with God. And just like we talked about covenant relationships tonight, just like 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that, that they were baptized into Moses and the sea in that first covenant, so too you have to be baptized into into Christ and put on Christ. That's how close that relationship needs to be. That covenant that we establish with Him has to be. Because certainly there is no salvation outside of Him. So if you're not yet a Christian, that's available to you. And all of these images of heaven, they're within reach through the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're willing to come in humble submission, confessing Jesus as the Christ, putting off that old man of sin, you can go down into a watery grave to rise, to walk in newness of life, being made pure and clean and holy by the blood of the Lamb. If you're already a Christian and you realize that you've not been faithful to the covenant that you made, God is long-suffering and patient and all he wants in this world is to accept you back to him. You know you're subject to that gospel call tonight. Won't you come now? Or well, together we stand while we sing. Think of a home over there by the side of the river of life where the saints all immortal are fair are robed in their garments of white over there over there oh think of the home over there over there over there over there oh think of a home over there oh think of the saints over there who before us a journey have trod of the songs that they breathe on the air in their home in the palace of God over there over there I think of a home over there over there over there saints over there I'll 
I'll soon be at home over there for the end of my journey I see all the saints and the angels are there are watching and waiting for me over there over there I'll soon be at home 